So good morning, good morning. I would like to welcome everybody to the Dami Fellows Program. Today we have a panel that will be talking about the significance of local and state politics. As we all know, this particular program seeks to train young scholars to be future thought leaders. Uh, today we have a panel of distinguished guests to speak on that topic specifically. We would like to thank our panelists for coming, and we'd like you all to thank you all for coming as well. So the order of the program, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, they will have 15 to 20 minutes for remarks, and then we'll open it up for Q&A for the fellows. So first I will introduce the City of Carson Mayor, Mayor uh, Lola Davis Holmes. Oh, I'm sorry. Dalla, uh, Davis Holmes. On November 3rd, 2020, Dalla Davis Holmes was elected as the first black female mayor of Carson. Immediately prior to that, spanning over a decade, Mayor Davis Holmes served as served the city of Carson as a city of uh, a city council member. As a resident of Carson for over 47 years, Mayor Davis, Davis Holmes has raised her family in this community and has devoted her career to improving the quality of life for all Carson residents. Her journey with, the Car with Carson began in 1980 when she was hired as the city's first female recreation center supervisor assigned to D at Stevenson Park. Within a few years, she was appointed to this position of recreation superintendent again as the first female in this position. She was first elected to the city council in 2007, re-elected in 2011 for a second term. In the third term, she was elected in 2015, and a fourth term, she was elected in 2019. Prior to her mayoral election in 2020, she was appointed twice as Carson's mayor pro tem. Long before her mayoral election, then council member Davis Holmes' goal was to improve the quality of life of all Carson residents. To accomplish this, she focused her attention on developing programs that would directly assist Carson residents. Two initiatives to reach the, that goal on the housing front were to help spearhead a workforce housing project for middle income residents of the, house, of, of the community and the development of affordable housing for seniors and veterans. To assure the, the city's financial health and stability, she supported Measure C, the utility use, uses tax and oil tax, and a pension obligation bond to address the rising costs of pension liability. Under her leadership as mayor, the city council passed the first structurally balanced budget in over a decade. As Mayor Davis Holmes looks forward to continuing her legacy of service of the city of Carson by supporting the adoption of the balancing city budget, she is a strong advocate for projects to make accomplishing, to make Carson a beautiful city for its residents as well as a destination city with a ultimate future, an unlimited future, my apologies. To accomplish this, she will continue to support city beautification projects, upgrading our parks, and low-income, middle-income, and market-rate income housing. She supports a balanced economic plan that includes bringing in businesses that provide sale tax revenues to the city and businesses that support community amenities, retail opportunities, and restaurants. Mayor Davis Holmes has been married to Harry Holmes for over 35 years. Together, they have six children and 14 grandchildren. She is an alum of the California State University of Dominguez Hills, Go Toros, where she received her bachelor's degree in sociology and her master's in public administration. She is a loyal, hardworking, and caring she is unapologetic in having high standards and encourages everyone to achieve and live their best life. 
She is a godly woman of integrity and can be trusted to make the best decisions possible for the good of all Carson residents. Carson is indeed her Beverly Hills. Our next speaker will be uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Joan Hilton. Joan Hilton is an educator and a pastor who is committed to bringing diverse groups of people together to get things done for Carson neighborhoods. He was elected to council in June 2015 and appointed as Mayor Pro Tem on January 23rd, 2018. He was reelected to his second term in November 3rd, 2020. Joan is the founder and senior pastor of City on the Hill Church in Carson. He also founded a school that focuses on helping at-risk youth with the education and job training they need to be successful. He previously served as a member of both Carson's Public Safety Commission and Human Relations Commission and worked as the Director of Public Policy for a local nonprofit organization. Born and raised in Carson, Joan attended Annalee Elementary School, Glenn Holmes uh, Curtis Middle School, and Carson High School. He holds a bachelor's from Cal State University Northridge and a master's of diversity degree for the Hayward School of Theology at Azuzu Pacific University. He's also a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Juwan has a wife. Juwan and his wife are, are uh, residents of the city of Carson. They are homeowners and are pe uh, parents of three adorable daughters. Lastly, we have Dr. Kalia Bradshaw. Kalia Bradshaw is a natural born leader, born and raised in, Car in Compton. Kalia was taught early on that it takes boldness and vision to create change. She held leadership positions all throughout her academic and professional career, such as student body vice president and chairing numerous higher education committees. Kalia moved to Carson at the age of 21. After transferring from Compton College, she received her bachelor's degree in English literature and master's degree in interdisciplinary studies with a special topic of English literature and Africana political thought from Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. She worked her alum master for over 10 years, serving as the admissions supervisor and the director of government and community relations. In 2020, Kalia received her doctorate degree in educational leadership from California State University, Long Beach. She graduated with honors. On December 13th, 2021, Kalia was appointed by the, the Carson City Council to serve as the city clerk. An, appointed, an appointment she received with greater honor and humility. She has stepped into a new role and is looking forward to build on a foundation that already existed as well as creating efficient procedures to enhance the work of the city clerk's office. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Mayor Davis Holmes as she provides her remarks. Good morning. Can you hear that? Good morning. Um, you sound up my entire speech. <laughs> But first of all, I'd like to say welcome and thank you for inviting me this morning. Uh, as my resume said, I live, work, and play in the city. Live, work, play, and pray. I live and pray in the city of Carson. Uh, but I, I'm excited. I chose this journey to be in politics uh, some time ago uh, when I started working and I, uh, was, uh, I knew Tom Bradley. I watched the work that he did and I was, a, uh, I was a secretary. I started off as a secretary. And my boss at that time said, you know, you need to go back to school. I only had two years of college. And I decided to go back to school. And my journey uh, was penciled out uh, when I left uh, the city of LA and when I came to Carson. Uh, 
where I am today is what I talked about in 1980, and that was to become the mayor of the city. And I put in action things that I could do to become the mayor of the city. And little did I know I was going to be the first African American female elected to that position. Because I have a passion for the city of Carson uh, and understand for me, uh, local government is where the rubber meets the road. A lot of people aspire to go other places, but my goal was always to be the mayor of the city of Carson. I have no aspirations for going on to the assembly, uh, uh, to the federal government. That was not what I want to do. It's not what I want to do because what I enjoy is walking through the city of Carson and seeing my residents. And on any day, if I don't have anything to do, I can go to the Carson Mall and I'm going to stay there the rest of the day. Because I'm making a point to know the residents in the great city of Carson. Uh, because I think we are a beautiful city, the best kept secret in the South Bay. And as I said earlier, local government is what it's all about. We make decisions that uh, affect the lives, the quality of lives for our residents. And I can see the fruits of my labor, labor as I walk through the city of Carson. Our job is to uh, generate revenue that would enhance the lifestyle and the quality of our residents through uh, generating revenue, building homes, uh, infrastructure, making sure that it is uh, what we wanted to see. And one time we were known as uh, having the best roads in the South Bay. Uh, right now, my colleague, uh, Bill Kim and I have put together a plan of action to bring that back to the city because local government is what makes that happen. Your infrastructure, your parks and recreation programs, which everybody knows is my first love because to me, uh, I call it front end loading. We invest in our children now, we invest now our pay later. And we have known as one of the best recreation, parks and recreation programs in the state of California. And we've received awards for that. So I can see that as I go through the city, uh, that we are, in the process of bringing the city back. You'll see our streets, trees, and uh, sidewalks are being repaired now. They were left undone for some time. Uh, my assemblyman, uh, Mike Gibson, I had to shake him a little bit. He was able to get, uh, I think it was $15 million? Yes. $15 million in revenue from our state assembly. That's assembly, that's the first time that has happened. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say what, what I need to make this city run. And we uh, passed a uh, get, uh, oil tax, first time in the city, history of the city of Carson, because with all the refineries here in the city of Carson, we were not getting any revenue. We're gonna be in court on that. But I'm not one, to, I always tell people I'm unbought and unbossed. Uh, my job is to do what's best for the residents of the city of Carson and work with our, our government, I mean our partners, our business community also. But everyone knows my first part is to the residents of the city of Carson. And I think it's important for our residents to get involved and engaged in local politics because you can become a part of the process and a closed mouth does not get fed. You come and let us know what it is that you need and if we're on the same page, we will make sure that it happens. We're not gonna always agree, that's understandable. But this is your city, this is my resident city. And uh, so uh, that's what I've been working on. We're working on Measure, it was off Measure R. It's What's Measure R now, it was Measure C. Uh, when I became elected, that was the first thing that I did. Uh, I pushed that. Because again, you cannot run a city without revenue. You cannot run it when uh, everyone else is saying, uh, you know, we don't want to pay. And that's my philosophy. People have a different philosophy. If you're in a city of cost, and I think you need to pay your fair share. It's not about you uh, giving me a campaign donation and you're going to sway my vote. That's not going to happen. Because as you're putting your agenda forth, and I tell everyone, last time I looked bloody, people have on that 405 freeway. You don't see what I see. My residents call me, they know where I live. Uh, and so I'm about the business of the people of the city of Carson. And, and that's what I've been known for. What you see is what you get is that what I tell people. I am, I was elected by the people. And I serve the people of the, rest of the great city of Carson. And I encourage all of you, young people, to look at getting into politics because we do need young people uh, to take our place. We need young people that we can train, that understand that you are.
are the voice of the future. Okay, you may st I stand on my uh, elder shoulder. Uh, I was mentored by the late, great Juanita Miller, thank God. She was our congresswoman. And that's the one thing she showed me. Stand for what you believe in. And sometimes I'm on the council, I'm the only one that will vote no. Because I believe in it. My vote is my legacy. And so we're governed by state laws. You know, we are, some of the laws that have been passed now is trying to strip local government of their power. Uh, because we uh, uh, pass ordinances and things that help us to, to land use uh, and what developments will come into the city of Carson, uh, what companies will come into the city of Carson and where they will be located. I'm a strong component uh, uh, supporter, cheerleader for our veterans. I say shame on us, United States of America, when I see veterans that are unhoused. So we came up with, with the Veterans Village. It's, it was a start, and I'm working on another veterans village to do our share, making sure that some of our veterans, veterans are off the street, not on the street. Because when they, I'm at home to sleep at night, they, they're they out fighting so that I can be at home to sleep. And I think it's an injustice for us to have any veteran that has served in this United States of America in any armed force, um, unemployed, unhoused, begging, on the street. I'm very passionate about that. Senior housing is another uh, area that was mentioned earlier that I'm compassionate about. And also, at one point in time, we address the missing middle. We have two projects in the city of Carson now that address the missing middle families. Because not all people want a home home. Uh, the missing middle consists of your doctors, uh, your school teachers, your firemen. They may not want a home home. They may not have a down payment. We have two projects in the city of Carson right now and the joint powers to make sure that we address the needs of our missing middle income, and that is the, uh, the Union at South Bay, and also uh, the Renaissance uh, apartments near uh, the pancake house. <laughs> I got a senior moment. So uh, basically, that's what I'm about. I think I encourage you as uh, graduates of my alma mater to get involved, to get involved because uh, you need to be at the table to make decisions that affect your life. And then if you want to go on to the next level of the state, then move over. Right here, your local government is one. Besides, when your streets are going to be swept, when your trash is going to be picked up, state politicians don't know about that. We do. And we talk about um, the issues that will affect our young people. And we, uh, you know, today, this month, we're celebrating Red Moon in the city of Carson. Because we're, we like to say that we're a drug-free city. We know that's not true, but we as elected officials want our kids to know that they're, you don't need to drink or smoke or use drugs. And there are alternatives for you if we want you to get involved in the programs. All week long, we're celebrating that. Um, I fought tooth and nail to keep marijuana out of this city uh, because I think it's a gateway to a future drug. And so that is my pledge to continue to fight for the residents of the city of Carson. You know that I'm not going anywhere. You may vote me out of office, but my residency, my live, work, and play, and pray philosophy will always be in the city of Carson as a local elected politician. As you heard my bio, my name is Jalon Hilton. I serve as a mayor pro the city of Carson. I'm also a board member of the Dining Institute. Uh, so I serve on the board of the Dining Institute as well. Help raise money for fellows and all those uh, projects uh, that we're uh, doing. And the wonderful work that Dr. Anthony Samad and the entire team uh, is doing. So uh, as you heard in my bio, uh, Grew up here in the city of Carson all my life, went to every local public school here. Uh, I didn't want to go to Cal State in the East because I just didn't want my mom to pop up on me. That just, <laughs> it just, that's why I went to Cal State North Ridge. I wanted to be close enough to home, but far away uh, where she wouldn't pop up on me. Uh, and then I went to Azusa Pacific. I had my Master's of Divinity from Azusa Pacific. I need to update my bio. I'm 
currently working on an doctoral program at Payne Theological Seminary. I'll be done in May of 2023. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, so my goal here is to serve the community, uh, a product of the community. I think that all politics are local. Uh, as the mayor said, that, uh, we couldn't get on the phone and call our president and tell him about our street issues, about our school issues, but you can call your local elected officials to encourage them to get in the fight and in the struggle with you. I was the youngest ever to be elected in the city of Carson. I was elected at the age of 35, actually, actually elected at the age of 34, and then uh, I was sworn into office on my 35th birthday. So I was the youngest ever to be elected, and uh, Carson had uh, been ran certainly by the, old gen the older generation. Uh, so it, it has been work trying to uh, intermingle the generations together. Sometimes me and the mayor don't, don't always agree, uh, and, uh, and she knows that. And uh, we don't always agree uh, with things that uh, may be uh, maybe like a generational gap, if you will. She, she's fought tooth and nail, and I give her uh, a thunderous applause for fighting tooth and nail for cannabis. Uh, while I am not an advocate of cannabis, I do recognize that cannabis exists. Uh, the Diamond Institute was awarded uh, a, a grant to research cannabis. Uh, and that's not uh, to research it in our communities. It's coming to our communities. Uh, we just have to figure out how to regulate it. So I'm good with it not being in Carson. However, uh, even though some cities have bans on cannabis, uh, they're still in their cities. Uh, so if you regulate it, you might know where it is. That was my whole thing. It wasn't that I was for it, never smoked it, never indulged in it, don't care about it. But I, my, I decided on the side was I would rather know where it is than not know where it is. But that's neither here nor there. But, so the generation, uh, I think, is so important. I don't know that I'm going to talk 15 minutes about myself, uh, but I think it's so important to get involved in local government. Uh, I started off as a commissioner. Uh, I was appointed a commissioner. I remember making a phone call. One of my friends who I was in high school with, he was killed. And I remember reaching out to uh, the council member at that time saying, you know what, this is ridiculous. We need more police on our streets. He was a uh, coming up basketball player, how dare this happens in our city? And then they said, well, you know what? If you want to be a voice, get on a commission. Uh, so I started there. And then uh, my voice over, uh, you guys are in what we call District 1. Uh, the city of Carson has been broken up into districts. We were uh, subject to a lawsuit. Uh, and we've been broken up in districts. So you guys are in my district, District 1. District 1 is on the cusp of having $8 billion worth of assets put right here in this district. Uh, we are working uh, very hard, my, the mayor along with myself are working very hard uh, to get a high-end outlet mall here on the 157 acres, also high-end restaurants. We deserve all of these things in our community. We shouldn't have to drive to Manhattan Beach. We shouldn't have to drive to all of these places. And uh, most of you know, uh, I think it was one year this week, uh, I saw it in my timeline, uh, we had, if you stayed in Carson or if you uh, watched the news, uh, there was a, a smell or an odor uh, that came through Carson. And one of my jobs was to fight uh, for my community and to make sure that they would treat us just like they treated Manhattan Beach when they had the Hyperion oil spill. And we brought out those environmental justice issues to make sure that they were responding like they would respond to a community that didn't quite look like them. Right now, the state is going through a housing element and they're improving our housing element. Uh, but at the last minute on this housing element, uh, they uh, wanted to dump something on Carson's general plan where they said that this particular area behind Cal State Dominguez on both sides, that they would want to drop an apartment building uh, that would have 3,000 units, a courtyard, and all of that into residential neighborhoods. But we're pushing back on that because why? They wouldn't do that in Beverly Hills. They wouldn't do that in Huntington Beach, uh, in Huntington Beach or Hermosa Beach. Uh, and it would be easy for them to assemble parcels of land in Carson, uh, being that the average home could be somewhere between 
uh, 600 to a million dollars opposed to assembling four or five parcels of land that are in Manhattan Beach at like $4 million a piece. They wouldn't assemble an apartment building in the middle of a residential community. So why would you do the same here? So these are the local fights that we have, the local things that we have to encounter to make sure our public safety is okay, to make sure that our university, this is for the first time, and I applaud the mayor for this for the first time, and how, how long has Cal State Dominion has been here? 54 years, the city of Carson now has an official partnership with Cal State Dominion. It is no way that in 54 years, we had a thriving school in our community, but we as a city didn't have a partnership. Now as you ride through the city, you see Cal State Dominion, you, uh, you see all of the signs and stuff now, but we should have been embraced that. This is a college town and we embrace those who are coming. So I, I'm going to reserve my uh, my 15 minutes for more questions and dialogue. Uh, I don't think it's a, it's it's enough to, to I don't want to talk about me, but it's not about me. It's about trying to hear your concerns, hear uh, your goals, your aspirations, your dreams. How do you create a productive plan to move forward to where you want to uh, move forward to? Uh, those are the things that excite me. Those are the things that's why we are uh, I'm a proud board member of the Diamond Institute. That's why I'm supporting the work like this, uh, because if we don't make a change on the local level, uh, it doesn't matter what you do nationally. I mean, yeah, gas is high for sure. Uh, food is at an all time high for sure. Uh, but then at the end of the day, it's gonna be about where you lay your head, it's where you raise your family, uh, if the area is safe, if the schools are credible, if the schools are good, uh, you want those things, those immediate things that you have access to, to be able to talk about them. And I want to be able to talk about them uh, with you. But also say I'm a proud member of Capital Outside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as it was mentioned, my name is Kalia Bradshaw. I serve as the city clerk for the city of Carson. I was appointed um, by Madam Mayor and MPT and the other members of council in December of 2021. Prior to that, I worked here at Cal State Dominguez Hills, my alma mater. Um, for about three years, I was the admissions supervisor. And then for about eight years, almost eight and a half years, I served as the director of government and community relations, which is in the division of university advancement. It doesn't have a lot of student interaction, but it's the division that's responsible for alumni, commencement, um, any stewardship events, and of course, uh, facilitating our relationship with local, state, and federal um, elected officials. So uh, the promise agreement that MPT was talking about was one of my last projects that I worked on, our town and gown promise agreement with the city of Carson. So it's definitely a full circle moment to work for the city um, after working here at CSUH for about 11 years. Everybody knows I bleed for Burgundy and Gold. I love this place more than anything. I was fortunate enough to grow up here um, academically and professionally. I transferred here from Compton Community College. I was 19 years old. I was a junior. I thought I was a boss um, and I just believed in that. I am somebody who makes a plan and I don't even know what that plan may turn out to be. I was going around telling people I was gonna be in politics when I was a little girl, I was like seven, saying I'm gonna go into politics. I had no idea that that would actually happen or how it would happen. It was just something that, one, people would bestow on me, but also something that I just started to believe. And it was the same way. Before I even transferred here, I was telling people I was gonna get a PhD. I had no idea what grad school was, nothing. My parents told me, get a degree in academic discipline. My dad was like, pick one. English, history, science, math. You'll never be unemployed if you get a degree in academic discipline. So I said, okay, English. So I majored in English. Everyone's like, what are you gonna do? I don't know. Decided I was gonna be an English teacher, high school English teacher. It didn't work out. I did that uh, for a short time. I was 22 years old, teaching 11th grade English for a hot second at Washington Prep. And uh, I was like, oh, I can do this. I'm from Compton. I can handle Washington Prep. I thought I was going to be like Michelle Pfeiffer on Dangerous Minds. It did not go well. 
I remember vivid, vividly telling the principal, I'm, I'm done. And they're like, I was covering for someone who was on maternity leave. And he was like, this is not how this works. And I was like, I have never quit anything in my life, but I am telling you now I will not be back tomorrow. And he said, what are you gonna do? I was like, I'm gonna go to grad school. And fortunately, I was in ASI when I was here in undergrad. I was in Pan-African Union. We did community service projects on Skid Row. We did the biggest and the best fashion show on this campus for years. We started scholarship funds, so a lot of administration knew me. And I remember calling the Vice President of Student Affairs at the time, Dr. Superego, and I said, I have to go to grad school. If I'm not in school, then I'm not on my mom's medical insurance. This is before Obamacare. And I was like, I have to go to school. So I signed up back here at CSUDH, trying to get a master's. What are you gonna major in? I don't know, I have a bachelor's in English. Let's get a master's in English. Like literally, I didn't really know what I was doing in the moment. I just knew I gotta be in school. I gotta figure this out. I got back involved in student government, got back involved in the clubs that I was involved in in undergrad, and I kept networking. And that's what really paved my way. I met Dr. Gamage like 10 or 12 years ago when I started my master's program here. And the networking, I, I tell people that's, that's what got me where I was. At the end of my master's program, that same VP who got me into grad school late was like, what are you doing this summer? I said, I'm looking for a job. She said, well, I have a bunch of stuff on my desk. I'm not gonna get to this summer. You can work for me for 90 days as an emergency hire, and then we'll figure something out. So I cleared her desk for three months, and I applied for every job on this campus. Somebody said, do you wanna be the admission supervisor? I said, okay, what do I have to do? Again, young, not knowing how to ask questions about morale or what's the staff like. I was like, cool, you guys wanna hire me full time? I get to wear a suit? Okay, I'll be somebody's boss. Walked in, staff had union grievances, didn't know what a union grievance was. I'm 24 years old, supervising people old enough to be my mom. And I went on Amazon, I bought every book, how to be a boss, boss, boss babe in the corner office, every book you can find on Amazon about leadership. I started reading things about um, Africana leadership, that, which is what I studied here in my master's program, and just learned the craft. I knew I wanted to be in charge, but I also knew that I wanted to be respected. I wanted people to like me. Um, I wanted to be kind. I wanted to lead with compassion. So I just read everything in sight about leadership and taught myself how to be a boss. I was the admission supervisor for three years. It was very stressful. Um, and then I took a $30,000 pay cut to be the assistant for the director of government relations, uh, David Gamboa at the time. And I just redid my whole career. I said I wasn't happy in admissions, took a step back and started over. And for eight years, I grinded in the government and community relations office until it became my office. And that shaped me into the leader that I knew that I wanted to be. And I started to see the plan that I was walking around saying in elementary school, I started to see that plan come together by the choices and the decisions that I made, by the people that I met, the network that I kept. Um, it kept me focused at a time where I really didn't know how my plan was gonna roll out, but I knew that it was going to be what I desired. Um, I made intentional decisions. I had a blast in college. I had fun, I did everything that I wanted to do right here in Carson at Cal State Dominguez Hills, but I knew that I was gonna end up in politics one day. So I was fortunate enough to do undergrad before social media. <laughs> so I remember when I was deciding now that I'm, I'm running for my position, I went, oh, you know, you need to scrub your Facebook. I said, no, I don't. I always knew I was going into politics. There are you know, pictures, I made intentional choices and intentional decisions, and the company that I kept respected that. My friends were like, oh no, that's the future PhD, no pictures, no pictures. Everyone knows that. So now I'm running for city clerk. I go out with my friend, don't tag her, don't tag Leah. We don't tag her on this. We don't. It was just something that has always been a part of me. And I'm saying all this to say, a lot of people now, um, you know, on Instagram or social media or whatever, and they talk about manifestation and, you know, you say what you want and all that. That's true, I don't necessarily call it manifestation. I, I call it planning. I mean, I knew what I wanted. I knew how I wanted my life to look. And I didn't necessarily have this guide or this how-to program on how to do it, but I knew that it was gonna take focus. I knew that it was gonna take an amazing network, people in my corner who 
who kept me. And I stayed that course, even though it may have been boring. You know, I sacrificed a lot of my 20s to stay in college. I got a bachelor's, I got a master's, took a whole bunch of extra units in that master's. Most master's programs are like 30 units. I have like 64. And then I worked here for seven years straight, grinding. And then I went and got a doctorate. So there's a lot of time where people are doing different things, but I was like in school grinding for a really, really long time. And that was because I knew it was going to manifest, I guess, this life that I wanted. I'm really fortunate. Um, I give honor to God. I'm grateful for the family and the upbringing that I have. And this is where my faith has, has landed me. I don't take any credit for, for where I am or the things that I've done. There are some really, really dark and low moments um, in the midst of that. And if it wasn't for my faith and if it wasn't for my mom who prayed over me when I was too depressed to get out of bed after George Floyd died and I didn't want to finish writing my dissertation, um, I just, I quit everything. I said, none of this matters. Like, I, that, that messed me up. And it was in my last semester of my doc program. And my mom came in my room and she laid hands on me. She prayed over me for 11 days until I got up and started writing again. So I'm not saying that this is just, you know, write it on your mirror and lipstick and it manifests in, you know, 15 years. There's some really dark moments, but you tap into what you have for me. That's my faith. Um, that's my village. That's the people who, who helped me. I was just talking to uh, Madam Mayor before we started about my campaign. This is mentally one of the toughest things um, that I've endured. I just prefer to be behind a desk doing the work, not necessarily in the front with everybody knowing me and Googling me and questioning me. Um, I had an opportunity to catch up with someone before we started and, and he watched the forum that was here about a month ago and he's like, you really held yourself together. I said, I was imploding on the inside. My brother was like, why were you talking like that? Like I was talking really low into the mic during the forum. I saw my shot at But I was like, I was fuming on the inside. So the only way that I was able to get my point across calmly was just to like take it all in. But all of this is a part of the journey. It's a part of the political landscape that I'm in now. Um, they talked in great detail about the importance of getting involved locally. And I am a huge proponent of using your voice. I had my first student government position in the sixth grade. I was the spokesperson for my sixth grade class. Um, at 11 years old, I spoke on behalf of 1,400 students. And that just put a spark in me. And I realized that when you speak up and when you're informed and you speak clearly and eloquently, people listen, even when you're 11 years old. Um, my first speaking engagements were in church, um, Easter speeches. And then at like 12 years old, I gave the Sunday school report every Sunday. I reported on how many absences we had, how much offering we got, and it just started there. So any opportunity I got a chance to be a leader it just further fueled like, I can do this, I can do this. And I was able to turn it into a career and now having an opportunity to serve the city in a local government capacity. It's just all part of the experience and the journey that I've been you know, fortunate to be on. Um, the last thing I'll say is the things that you're passionate about and that you're aware of at whatever age, even if you think back to what you were interested in when you were in elementary school, you can turn that into something that you can be passionate about in a career. I remember being really intrigued by local politics. I grew up in Compton. Um, I remember being in the first grade and one of my friends, his dad was a councilman in Compton. And that just sparked my interest. My parents watched the news a lot and I would just watch that. I remember when Chelsea Clinton rode to the White House when Bill Clinton was elected. And those are the things that I remember in my mind, like, why well, do I do that? How do you do that? How do you get into that? And that's what sparks your sort of imagination. And I think sometimes the last thing I'll say is that as a community, black people were robbed of our dreams. Um, we're, we're not allowed to have the, the, the fantasy or your happily ever after, whatever that is. Um, but I believe that we deserve it as a people, as a community. So the things that you reflect on in your childhood that made you happy, um, the things that spark joy in you, I encourage you to write those things down and plan around it because that could be the life 
that is on the other side of your notebook. I take notebooks with me everywhere. I jot things down, things that come to mind. Your life and your, your plan, um, political nature or not, but it's the it's your thoughts to your words that maybe you're not saying out loud, and maybe your voice is what's missing in our local government. Thank you. So next we would like to open it up for uh, questions from the fellows or any comments that you all have. All right, Mr. Pitts. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my question is, civics classes aren't really uh, taught in our K through 12. How do we get involved into the local uh, government? Like, is there a, a process? Like, you go online, you have to get signatures. Like, how do you become a leader in a community? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, well, uh, in the city of Carson, we have something called commissions. That people can serve on every commission. Uh, all you have to do is be a resident. Uh, it's uh, women issues, there's public safety, there's human relations. I believe we have about 20 or 30 commissions in the city of Carson. There's a place to serve, parks and recreation. And in every city, not just limited to the city of Carson, uh, those uh, applications are on file in the city clerk's office, and you can pull an application, apply for them. Uh, the only criteria is you have to be a resident uh, of the city of Carson. And even when I was uh, younger, they had a youth commission. So those people who may be young, aspiring to uh, affect change in their community, uh, I, I would tell them to be a part of the commission. Uh, my first job uh, in the city of Carson was at a park, uh, 16 years old, and uh, that was what got my spark into wanting to, like, hey, maybe I should be for the city, you know, work for the city or something. That was, that was a distinguishing role to be the commissioner at a young age. So I, I suggest anybody to get involved. And then another way to get involved is to uh, find out when the local city council meetings are. Uh, you can go and voice your concerns, speak for public comment, uh, tell people all the time. Like, you know, people pay attention to people who come and speak. I know I pay attention to, to the people who come and talk public comment. And, you know, figure out like, you know, what's their angle? What are they trying to accomplish? You know, and then when people come and speak to public comment, you let your local elected officials know, like, hey, man, we're watching you. We're watching the stuff that you're doing. We're watching, uh, you know, the decisions that you're making on behalf of the community. And when people don't hear from people in public comment and tell them, do you want to change a room or change the outcome of a vote or change something, show up at public comment. Uh, show up and give public comment to it. Give, you know, give some public comment, public commentary to it to let the people know that you're watching and they'll listen. In addition to what MPT said, uh, the best, another way to get involved in your city is to volunteer. Volunteer your time and your talent uh, in some nonprofit organization and the Parks and Recreation Program, uh, the Carson Women's Club, who is the uh, beneficial hostess for the city. You volunteer your time and your talent and you learn what's going on in the city of Carson. Um, I was a volunteer when I first started out. I was a team mother at Delamo Park. And from that, I met people. When you know people, when you engage them, when you have, you, they hear your voice and your concern. The residents came and asked me to even come and work for the city because I started out as a volunteer. When the job opened as a, of course, a park director, the, someone from the, I think it was human relations, the community relations, Commissions came, got me. We want you to work for our city. I was working in LA, but I put so much time into volunteering my time with my children that were growing up in the park. And I always tell people to volunteer for these service organizations. Not only uh, your voice lends us with another perspective of what it is that you want to say. I said it earlier, closed mouth doesn't get fed. I don't listen to the gadflies that come before city council because I can count them on my hand. If some people they don't care what you do, they're not gonna like it. I do listen to young people when they come before the city council and express their concerns about relevant issues, not attacking us as elected officials. Uh, also, with you being there, we have to be transparent. You know, you get to see us. 
and to say, hey, I, uh, you know, I agree with you, I don't, but we hear you, we hear you. But I don't listen to the advertisers. I know who they are. I do not listen to them. They can fill that council chamber during the election time we're gonna have them come. Thank God we are. Because some people call and they say, but I tell my residents all the time, if there's something on the agenda that affects you, come and speak and let me know. You don't have to beat us up to say, hey, there's always, there's no right or wrong way to do anything, but volunteerism is the best way to get involved in the city of Carson. Uh, we host a volunteer banquet every year to honor our volunteers because there is no price that we can pay for the amount of volunteer hours that we get. Uh, my campaign was ran by volunteers. Uh, you know, I pulled in about 100 volunteers each time I run because I wanted to expose my volunteers to the political side of it. It's not, not all glamorous. I try to uh, incorporate young people into my campaign uh, so they can learn how uh, the process works. Because campaigning, do, I, I, just, I just can't stand it. But I would say volunteerism, it gives you a better understanding of what your needs are in the community, what's going on in your city. Because after all, it's the resident city. We were just elected, and I, I say it all the time, all 96,000 of our residents cannot sit on this disc, but you can elect five that have your best interests in mind, and, the, and that's what it's about. So not only the commission, volunteer your time and your talent. Uh, and you get to meet so many people. You get to meet people you know, from various walks of life, and, and then when you're out at the mall, you see them. And you have things in common with each other because you're volunteering your time and your talent. So the city clerk's office is first and foremost responsible for keeping and maintaining the city's records. So that's all the minutes, the ordinances, the resolutions, the laws, all of the paper. Um, we keep uh, the order of public comments that come in. So as the mayor and MPT talked about public comments during city council meeting, we also get written communication. So it's my job to forward that to Madam Mayor's office, her staff to make sure that she's informed of what the residents and what people are saying. We get um, all of the concerns and all the complaints, but if someone trips on a curb, if someone wants to submit a claim to the city, we are the receiving arm for any legislation, legislative body piece of work. So if there's a subpoena, if there's a claim, if there's an ordinance, if there's anything related to the legislative body, so the, the five members that sit on council, we receive that on behalf of the city. Um, in addition to that, we take care of the city bonds. Um, any official document, any piece of work outside of actual cash that goes to the city treasurer's office comes through the city clerk's office. So all of the, um, the minutes, we're responsible for keeping track of that, watching the videos, uploading that, all of the city contracts, so contracts for tree trimming, contracts for putting up Christmas lights, contracts for anything that we do. Um, we keep those and we put that on record as well. And then um, one of the last most important things that we do is we maintain and facilitate the California Public Records Act. So under the California Public Records Act, um, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud because we already have a lot of public records requests, but you are able to submit a public records request. You will be surprised what is considered public record. I know during campaign time, we're like, I get robocalls. Your information is public record. So if you get a robocall for me, please be nice. Um, and we facilitate that. So by law, we have to respond to that. So if you say, I would like a copy of all of the contracts for tree trimmers from 1997 to the present, by law, we need to get that information to you within a certain amount of time. And so we have a lot of concerned residents in Carson. So the California Public Records keeps my office very busy. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. I don't know what that's So uh, in college here, we have ethics, uh, ethics studies classes, like Dr. Gamble's classes. Um, how important is it for us to have like uh, uh, 
ethnic cl uh, school classes so we can have better leadership and know about black history so we can be better and more informed voters and leaders in our community. Period. Period. I keep on uh, black studies, Africana studies. Um, my parents supplemented my education when I was younger, so I, I grew up in a, in a very pan-African home. My father was in the Nation of Islam for years, so it's, it's something that was very natural to me, but I developed so much. I am the person that I am, the woman that I am, and the leader that I am because of the Africana Studies Department here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I was trained under uh, Dr. Munaji Bruso, West in Power, um, who was one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Gamage, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, even Dr. Nickel. Now, I love this department. Um, I was just talking to Dr. Gamage a couple, uh, maybe yesterday, telling him that at some point I would love to come and adjunct and teach. So I believe a lot of people say, well, what can you do with a Black Studies degree? Anything you want. Because in this country, we still are in a racial higher structure uh, with white supremacy and that whole situation still very much exists. So I believe that as an African-American community, we need an African-American framework for every decision that we make. Um, I was just having this conversation walking up here this morning. My brother, we were going back and forth over this segment on CNN. And they're like, oh, you know, what have Democrats done for black people? So we're going to do this whole, you know, kind of conversation. Every single decision that I make politically, I use from an Africana framework. So that's just my personal opinion. I push that on everybody who will listen. I think it's really, really important that we have a framework for the decisions that we make. And for me, that framework is an Africana mindset for, for me personally. So that's my very biased answer to your question. <laughs> I, I think it's important that I, I took a whole Pan-African Studies. All of my classes that I took was through Pan-African Studies, most of them at Cal State uh, Northridge until I you know, had those classes where I couldn't take them through the lens of Pan-African Studies. But I think uh, having, having professors who identify with you, uh, who want to make sure that you make the best of your college experience, being able to look through the lens. Um, while it may not always be politically popular, we see what's happening in Los Angeles now uh, with the council members uh, who were attempting to uh, cut us out, uh, cut cut uh, our collaborative black power out, or uh, cut us out at the table to say, you know, we're going to cut this district in a certain way. Uh, while it may not be popular to say, but every race is thinking about their race when they're sitting making decisions. Uh, and I want to encourage you to have our seats at the table, to be able to look at it through the lens because everybody's looking out for their people, right? Everybody's looking out for their people. And essentially what, uh, what these three council members in Los Angeles said, they gave you the, uh, the lens as to what they were looking out for to cut black power. The challenge is um, with black leadership, the challenge with black leadership is this, is that success is not really success without a successor. Everybody else is grooming their successor, right? Everybody else is grooming their next generation, but when it comes, I feel like our political leadership, they're not grooming the next generation. They, you know, they'll, they'll be 100 years old and still try to serve, still try to get elected. We have to groom the next generation. The next generation, what the Dodley Institute seeks to do is to have a political think tank so that she will be the tapped next generation to be able to explore and to be able to make policy decisions that will affect our community. Because if we don't make policy decisions that will influence and affect our community, they will infect our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you mentioned that you read leadership books. What are some books you recommend? Um, I will send you a list. I, I, I have a list on Amazon, okay. so I, I will send you a list. But I, I like to read um, autobiographies. So some of the books that I glean the most from are not necessarily leadership in title, but I like to read people's life stories. So if there's someone that I like, anybody, it could be someone in entertainment, just someone that I think, oh, they seem like they have an interesting life. I pull from that because I like to see how people make decisions 
or what their thought process was in decisions. Um, just woman to woman, I am a single woman with no children, and I am in a position of leadership. I've always been in positions of leadership. So I like to read things that impact me that don't disregard my other identities, right? So the first thing about me is that I'm black, the second thing is that I'm a woman. So I like to read things that speak to those parts. And so it may not be a leadership book, but it may be something about um, the feminist movement, even though I recognize that the original feminist movement didn't include black women. Um, so I like to read things about African womanism. I read, I've read almost everything by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, I just, I pull from those things, but I also just finished uh, Sonia Curry's autobiography, and it was outstanding because I was interested in how she raised three children, and now she's having this sort of like resurgence in her life as a divorcee. And like, I just like to read different things that I think might speak to either something that's in me now or something that may uh, just speak to something that I think that they're doing. So I read a lot. I, it's the first thing that I do. I read um, five songs and a proverbs every day. I read all of the headline news that come out of Associated Press. Um, so I, I'm like an avid reader. A lot of times people are like, you're always on your phone. I'm always reading. So just fill yourself with topics of interest and then your own personal list will come from that. But um, I, I read all of them. I don't read any fiction. So I, I always read um, nonfiction and mostly autobiographies. Thank you. Uh, let me add to that also. Uh, you do a lot of reading, but I'm going to give Doc with this list. I keep it, I've had it since 1980. It's called Leadership Skills for Women. And in that little bitty pamphlet, it tells you what to expect as a woman leader and how to react. I refer to it anytime I go for an interview, and I keep it and when I, because sometimes we as women, the way you walk in the room will tell you how you're gonna be treated in a male-dominated society. So when you walk into a room, you gotta walk into that room with assurance and with power. And you never, ever let anyone downplay your role as a woman or talk to you. Oh, honey, we have that. You don't call your current partner, honey. You respect him. I'm Madam Mayor. Okay, so this book I'm going to give to uh, the title to Khalil when she sends it to you, but it's called Leadership Roles for Women. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, we talk about leadership. Uh, from your experience, what is leadership? Why is it important, especially when it comes to politics and government, and for us, just on our, our everyday lives? First of all, as a leader, you have to understand one thing. In order to lead, you have to have willing, people willing to follow. Because if you don't have people willing to follow, you're not leading. And you have to know what you're leading. You have to have a plan and goals and objectives uh, for your leadership. Which, which, what direction are you going in? Or what direction do you want your uh, community and your constituents to go in? Uh, and that's why I say it's important for you as upcoming leaders to get involved because your voice is critical. Uh, it determines what direction your city or yours is going to go in. You have to be heard. I always say in order to be a good leader, you have to have people that's willing to follow. That's, that's the rule that I live by. Could you repeat that last one? In order to be a good leader, you have to have people that's willing to follow. I, I want to take it a step further. I want to say in order to be a good leader, you, you have to be a good follower first, right? You have to observe somebody. Uh, people just come on the scene and they just want to lead, but they never have to, uh, they, never, they never knew how to follow. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a pastor too, y'all, right? So I tell people that, that God can't trust you with a staff if he's never trusted you on a staff. And uh, when, when we come to uh, people in leadership, like I've always been leading. I was, a, I was a class president in sixth grade. And I took over, uh, I'm no longer a pastor in Carson, but now I'm a pastor in Compton. I took over a historical church that had been there for 65 years. Uh, it, 
it, it hadn't, you know, they, they were living off off the past, uh, you know, experience. And you, you had a group of people. You had some who wanted to move forward. You had some who didn't want to move forward. But my leadership ability, uh, you know, they say when you take over uh, already established church, this is uh, for my other my other job. When you take over other established church, you're not the pastor for seven years. But in the first year of leadership, I complete I, I completed something that it, it, the, the last leader uh, openly confessed to me that you did something you did something in a year that would have took me ten years to do. And one of the reasons why I, I believe as a leader you have to have the ability to be a consensus builder. You have to be a even when you don't like people's opinion, you still have to listen to them. Right? I tell people all the time I'll meet with anybody. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you all the time. But a leadership skill applies when you've been a good follower and when you don't always have to push your opinion. Sometimes you got to make people think that it's, it's their own idea, even though it's your idea. Uh, that's an effective leader. An effective leader too. They take people when they pull them way in. Uh, so leadership uh, is, is important. And all of us are developing leadership skills. Uh, even now, you're developing leadership skills. Sitting in a room, uh, I learn from watching people. Some of the best uh, uh, teaching moments is what not to do, right? Uh, like, oh, I'm gonna do that. I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do that. And as Khalid said, we live in a day of social media, so uh, a leadership nugget that I would give you: if you aspire uh, to go anywhere in life, be careful what you allow social media to see, right? You don't have to let everybody know you pop bottles. You don't have to let everybody know uh, you smoke this or you smoke that. Those things can come back and be a detriment. Uh, when you decide to rise to the level of prominence or when you decide that that stuff, that life ain't for you anymore, someone will always go deep sea, uh, deep diving and deep, deep sea fishing for your past. But you want to make it hard and social media makes it easy for them to find stuff from your past. Uh, so you want to make it hard for somebody to try to take you down over something you did for your past. I think that's leadership. The only thing I'll add to that is um, I love what MBT said about developing. And I consider my leadership skills developing and evolving as I continue to grow. When I was younger and in ASI here, I was pretty radical. I was, people used to call me Malcolm X. Like I was really like, we're going to the president's office and we would like march up to Dr. Garcia's office and tell her like, we're not standing for this. I mean, it's kind of laughable now, but I mean, it was like really kind of irrational. <laughs> like we were leading this like mighty few, which in my mind we were like leading, you know, the Israelites, but it was like probably like eight people. Um, and we would like march to Welch Hall and like make these demands. And so as I stayed here, you know, um, sometimes, you know, God kind of allows you to stick around for these full circle moments. And I remember a few years ago, there was an ASI board um, and they had like written like a list of demands. Um, this was after the racial incident that happened at Mizzou. And I was just like, okay, you guys, you don't really know how good you have it. Like, it was like this full circle moment for me, like as a staff person, but I, I had to like step back and like, you know what, no, fight the battle. You, you, you go give Dr. Franklin that list, you know, let me know how that works out for you. But I just, I, my, I, I'm not ashamed to say that my leadership is still you know, developing and evolving as different circumstances happen. And I think you, for me at a, at a younger age, like in my 20s, being a leader was being bossy. You know, I thought that if I could just tell people what to do, um, that that made me a leader. And I think because sometimes people just follow, I was like, no, no, I'm a leader, I'm doing this. I will say most recently, and I share this, um, I shared this at the forum a month ago, and I, I shared it with my staff and the staff meeting. Um, I told them that when I became the city clerk, I had talked to people and I had, you know, talked to members of council and had done my research and I was coming in with this plan and I was, you know, implementing my plan because I'm a boss and I'm showing up every day and I'm like, I'm a city clerk now, this is what we're going to do. And my staff was like, okay, but I wasn't like feeling the passion. I was like, I'm in charge and why aren't you guys like getting behind me? I have an idea, I have a plan. And I had to take a step back and realize that in their, in, in, from their experience, in the last couple of years, they had watched their chief deputy clerk resign, then their city clerk resign, 
then a temporary came in, then he resigned. And now I'm here with my plan and my ideas and my, you know, I'm wearing a blazer, I wear sneakers, like this is who I am, respect me, I'm young, I'm fabulous, and I'm a boss. And it just was not, it was not translating. And I'm like, this is what I do. I, I come in, I run departments, I've been doing this for a long time, guys, trust me. But they were like, no, are you staying? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, don't, why are you even asking me that? Do what I'm telling you to do. But I had to take a step back and realize they've been through some stuff. They've had several, you know, it's like Destiny Shout in there for a little while. People just kind of coming in and out. They wanted to know, am I staying? Like before I jump on board, and it, it was a huge slice of humble pie for me. And I said, I'm doing this all wrong. And I and I and I admitted that to them. I said, I am sorry. I did not validate your experience. I did not validate what you all have been through. And so that was a clear example of my leadership evolving and, and developing. Because I had a plan, my plan is good. We're, we're still gonna do my plan. But I had to take a step back and really empathize with where my staff had been. They, they were there before me. And I needed to earn their trust. And that started with, one, answering their questions and saying yes. And I remember telling, Juwan, I remember telling MPT, like, I haven't told anybody that I want to run. This was like in the summer or the spring. And I was I was scared to say it out loud. I was scared to put it on Facebook. I was scared to put it on Instagram that I, I was going to run for this job. And I was like, if I can't even tell my staff, I'm going to tell the residents that this is a job that I want for the next four years. And it started with leadership in my own office, telling my staff, yes, I'm saying, yes, I'm planning on running, and earning their trust. And now we're rolling. We're, we're moving. I'm listening to them, they're listening to me, we have staff meetings every week, but I had to sort of pivot in my own leadership sort of ideology. And that's why I tell people all the time, you're allowed to change your mind. Sometimes you think you have this like, great idea and you're, you're leading and you're passionate, but it's not working. And I had to take a step back and ask, why isn't it working? And it's because I wasn't listening to them and I hadn't validated their experience. So. Um, I love the idea of developing leadership. You're never too old to learn. Um, you're never too old to kind of take a step back and maybe pivot and revisit. Maybe this isn't the best approach. So, well, since she hasn't spoken, I'll come back to you, Mr. Pitts. I think he over here. Well, let's come here and then I'll go to Mr. Hunt. What would you say, this is a question for the panel, the whole panel, what would you say is the most challenging part of your job? Uh, it's thankless. <laughs> no, it's thankless. You know, I, I think one of the most challenging, when you know you've made the right decision, uh, and it might not be popular, uh, and then people criticize, uh, you know, I tell I was, I was thinking of this one, Dr. Bradshaw was talking, and you can never take a, you can never let success go to your head, and you can ne never let failure get to your heart, right? So sometimes when you make decisions that you know, that you stand on the conviction of, I'll go back to, to, to campus, right? <laughs> and I just sort of like, you know I'm on campus in the city, but I felt like after I did all of the research, after I had did everything, uh, you know, looked at other cities, I felt in my heart that I had made the right decision. My character was attacked, you know, I, like I said, I was taking money from cannabis people. I mean, it was, it was a whole mess. They, uh, those people who were on the opposite side, they were like on a quest to take a young guy out, a pastor, who, you know, who, who did this, who did that, he did this, but it was just my opinion. And sometimes, even in leadership, uh, you can you can do things, stances that people don't understand, and know that you've done the right thing. Uh, but it was hurtful to know that I had did the right thing in my heart to be challenged, to be attacked, to be all of those things. So sometimes, even when you make the right decision, you stand on the conviction because there's always going to be somebody who think you made the wrong decision. Uh, and this old lady. Pull me to the side, and she says, "Listen, the leadership you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all the people all the time." And that literally revolutionized my thinking and my life. Now I still have moments because we're all human, right? We're all human, and we we want to make sure that we uphold the highest standard, do the highest thing. 
But even when you make the right decision, people may not always agree. So that's been one of the most challenging parts of my job. Uh, knowing that in me, I'm trying to make the right decision. I tell people all the time, my mom lives here, my sisters, my brothers uh, live here. I'm raising my family here. Hopefully one day my children will be homeowners here. We all own homes here. So I'm not gonna make any decisions for this community that's gonna be bad for our community. Because at the end of the day, I'm invested in this community. I'm not just a fly by night, uh, I'm here. But those are the times where they are most challenging. And in addition to that, it's getting the information out that we need to our residents to find out why we're making the decisions that we make. Because not all people know they like um, when you look at all the social media, everybody has their spin on it, which may not be true. And our job is to get the information out to our residents as to why we're making decisions and how they're gonna affect the quality of life in our particular communities. And so that has been a challenge also and also for as a city council getting all of us uh on the same page as a mayor that does not always happen my my goal is to not always have what's a three two vote on the city council but at the end of the day if the three two works and we think it's best for what the residents uh, feel uh that we feel is best for the residents we're going to move forward but uh, it bothers me all these years a three three two vote it's a three two vote how do i get our message out that this is best for the city of Carson and, and take out all the politics because at the end of the day it's about what is best for the city and and also building that team uh, spirit the team spirit I think it's good to have a team approach when you're approaching some of these problems but getting our message out to the residents has been very very difficult and like I tell everybody not all people are on social media and everything that you see in, on social media read is not always true. It's always slanted in one direction or the other. So I don't curtail that because it has played a part in a lot of our, uh, the information, that, the information chain. And I want to empower our residents to come and speak and to get the information out to them. I've been trying to think about how, how I wanted to answer uh, your question. People have asked me that before, and I think I've said, you know, the, the people are the most challenging, not the residents, the residents are fantastic. Um, but working in a different environment, um, I grew up in a family of, of baby boomers, my mom, my aunties, they all worked for LA County, 35 years, got their pension, retired, and now they're the ladies who lunch. Um, they, they're living a great life. And I just grew up in, in a lot of structure. So I got my good state job, as my dad would say, at you know, Cal State Community Schools when I was like 24 years old and started paying the CalPERS. And so I had this, this structure. So I worked here for 11 years. That's all of my 20s and into my 30s. And I was used to just one way. And because I was a student leader here, I have a lot of autonomy. So I walk into a room, I have ideas, I sit on committees, I get nominated to chair certain committees, and people on this campus, they they just believe me, they respect me, and I, I really got my way. You know, I, I was really fortunate to grow up in a, in a safe space around a lot of black people, a lot of black administrators. Um, the current president is black, the vice president is black, and black VPs. And so I felt really nurtured in a safe sort of working environment. That's not everyone's experience as a staff person here at CSUH, I recognize that, but that was very much my experience. Coming into City Hall, it's a much smaller organization. Some people knew me, but a lot of people didn't. I am a local girl, been on this campus for a long time, did a lot of stuff with the city before, but working inside City Hall has been a challenge for me and just the type of sort of leader and personality that I am. All of the autonomy that I had here at CCH, it didn't come down the street with me to at all. So when I like say things or I want things done yesterday and it's not happening, I was like, I was questioning myself. And so again, it's the it's the developing leadership, it's the pivoting, it's me taking a step back and not taking everything so personal. I think MPT has to tell me that like once a week, like don't take it so personal. But I I also and just like a really, really like passionate person. I'm a 
quintessential millennial, like my picture should be next to that definition. I want things done yesterday. I feel like if I have the passion and the burning desire to get it done, then it should be done yesterday. And you know, I'm like, well, if you're smart, figure it out, let's get it done. Like that's kind of like, my, <laughs> that's just like my thing with, with everything. And so that has been a challenge working in a different um, structure and what I've done to sort of calm that challenge down and keep me focused on what I need to do is focus on the things that I can control, which is my office. So, you know, I tell my staff all the time, I'm just gonna lead by example. I'm not gonna complain about how much paper is around here. I'm gonna reduce the amount of paper in here. No more printing, scan it. <laughs> do not print it and hand it to me, scan it. Send it to my phone. So I was getting overwhelmed by these sort of challenges, but a lot of them, it's just, it's refocusing and it's working with the things that you can control. And that's my personal challenge, like for, for my life, for my lifestyle as a person, is not being so overwhelmed by the, the grandiose or the mountain, just kind of focusing on the hill in front of you. And turning the challenge into a lesson. So this is my first time campaigning. This is the first time that anybody's really just went online and talked about me or lied on me. These are the first times that I've, that I've dealt with that. So rather than seeing that as a challenge, it's turning that into a lesson and standing in my truth and saying the right people, the smart people, <laughs> they know me, they know the truth. And then focusing on that and not focusing on the negative because the word challenge can it can become a focus to where that, that's what you're concentrating on. But if you flip that challenge into a lesson, you learn the lesson and you keep on moving. Challenges are like, how am I gonna focus on this? How am I gonna overcome it? And you can kind of get stuck there. And so I like to keep things moving. So um, I appreciate that question because even in answering it, it's kind of helping me refocus and to just make sure that I'm using that as a lesson and not harping on the fact that this is a challenge that I can't overcome. Thank you. Mr. Hines, and then Mr. Pitts. Okay, uh, my name is Jeffrey Hines uh, with the President of the So I heard something very uh, key for me is that you mentor, I'm having to bridge a generational gap. And I heard that there's a generational gap that needed to be mended for y'all to do your jobs accordingly. And I heard that success isn't success without a successor. So like, what tips would you give me to being able to build that generational bridge to, so that we can come together and on one accord? I, I think one of the things is to uh, hear their ideas out, let them know why it's uh, uh, me, me, and, me and the mayor have been working together great uh, since she's been uh, elected mayor. Uh, and I think uh, not to let outside forces influence you building a partnership or a relationship. It's no way, I mean, the mayor should have been at odds. And the mayor watched me grow up, right? Uh, three doors, her and my mom still stays three doors from each other. But political landscape uh, had us to be at odds with one another, not being able to respect each other's opinion or, or something like that. So I think when it's when it comes to trying to bridge the gap, have a sit down, talk, and say, hey, this is this is this that's not how I see it. And this is no form of disrespect on how I see it. This is just how I see it through this lens. And, and be able to to talk and to be able to nurture uh, and to be able to see. Uh, and most of the time when people are trying to build relationships, they talk around each other and don't talk to each other. Right, so I, I think those are the things. Like if I have something, if I, the mayor, I, I don't agree with this. I, I need to talk to you about this one more. She'll call me and like, I don't, I don't agree with this. And she'll hear my side, I'll hear her side, and then we can come up to an agreement to say, hey, either we're working like this, or I could be with you, or I can't be with you on this issue. But I think those, that's just in life too, right? Uh, because as uh, young people growing up, you're gonna encounter a lot of things where you just want to say like Leah, oh, it's my way. You got to do it my way. But she had to hear these people out to figure out how they saw something and put themselves in uh, their shoes and think about it for a minute. So sometimes when you're in leadership, you can't just turn it around like real quick or 
sometimes it takes time. You have to teach people or uh, be able to invest in people. So I think uh, those are one of the things. And so you brought Brother Hooker to say, right? Everybody I'm doing a shameless plug, I'm having a sneaker ball on uh, December 10th. My original sneaker ball was on December 9th, but that's the Brotherhood Crusades dinner yes. game. Now, I, I, I know Danny Bakewell, I know all the people, we, we have some other relationship. It probably wouldn't have mattered if I did it on their day or my day, but out of respect and deference, I changed my date because I'm saying this black political power is over here. They may not come to my event, but I'll, I got enough deference to respect to say, you know what? I pulled my, uh, they already had their date. Let me pull my date back because I respect the elders or the, or the generation before me. And I know enough to know to say, and you know, I, by the way, I got invited to be in the room, so I'm like, oh, we're going to that party and the next party. But the reality is that we can't be in competition with each other. The older generation and the younger generation, we can't be in competition with each other because we need one another, right? It's no competition, we need one another. I need the mayor to pull me up. Hopefully she will endorse me for mayor when she decides to, to uh, leave the mayor, uh, mayor office. But I'm not going to do anything to make her look bad to to push her. It will be her decision to say, uh, you know, I'm done running for mayor. But I'm not going to say, you know what? I, I think I could beat her as mayor, even if she runs as mayor. I'm, I'm not going to say that to myself and say I'm going to run against her regardless. No, I think we should not be in our in a place where we think we can just go around somebody or we can fight against each other. Because if we fight against each other, if we run at the same time, it's only gonna open up a way for our opponent or for the other person to run up in there. Because two, two of us was fighting. You understand what I'm saying? So that, that's that's the leadership principle I've been thinking of, the intuition principle. I think for me, what is, uh, what is the mayor? of the city of Carson when I was elected. There is no right way or wrong way. Um, and we all have to come together uh, one, from the one accord if we're here for what we say we are, that's for the people of Carson. Uh, what I've also learned is that uh, for you to build your mentorship program, you gotta listen to what they have wanna say. Uh, when you pay attention to people that's trying to get to the next level, you have to listen to them. You have to hear them. You have to put them in the decision-making arena, that they are part of the process, and that they will become a part of the solution. That was one thing that I found uh, when I was uh, working and, and had a project that I was trying to get built uh, here in the city of Carson. I brought all the young people to the table, and I said, what is it that you want to see? You know, if it doesn't affect safety and quality of life, then let me, hear your ideas and pay attention to you. Uh, it was a simple project and we were, we were putting in new playground equipment. Well, I don't know nothing about how what makes them happy. So I brought all the young people in. I said, what is it you want to see on this piece of equipment? And the equipment, the playground equipment was built on their needs and what they wanted. And, then, and at the end, they took care of it because they bought into the concept, they bought into the idea, and they were part of the process. So listening to what your, your mentees have to say, incorporating uh, their voice into the decision making and let them be a part of the decision making arena because there is no right or wrong way but we all gonna agree on one accord and at the end of the day, that's what I'm looking for, consensus. Consensus on what's best for those that's gonna be affected. So we'll, we'll take one more question. Uh, I know you had your hand up, Mr. Pitts. Is your question yeah. answered? Or? Yeah, it was kind of his question, but like, I'll frame it in a different way. Um, I learned here at Dominguez Hills about a term called Sankofa. So when you look back into the past, it informs your present and hopefully um, helps your future. How do we go into our community to our parents' generation, <coughs> boomers' generation? I'm, a, I'm an older millennial, I'm 39 years old, so I'm gonna come back to school and how do we communicate with our community, like our parents, our grandparents, from all the knowledge we learned in, in, in college, and how do we go and communicate and have a good dialogue with someone who may from a different culture, a 
different age, um, uh, a different political spectrum. Um, how do we communicate that with them in a way where we learn from, say, the older person uh, and not like, like you say, talk around them, but how do we talk to them, not as a politician, but as a human being? How do we have these conversations with them and bring it back to uh, other areas of our lives where we talk to them about uh, politics or economics or the housing or I'm a veteran, so how we talk about veteran issues, all these issues we learn. How do we communicate in a respectful way um, to our older generation or the younger generation and have a better dialogue? It's a big question, I'm sorry. Super big. <laughs> I just think uh, just being a listening ear or to uh, a lot of times when people go to college, they want to come back and let everybody know they're the smartest person in the room, right? Uh, but experience is the best teacher. And uh, while we may have so many, uh, so much book knowledge, uh, we gotta have heart knowledge as well to be able to communicate with people right where they are. Um, and those might not be the conversations to, uh, you know, express uh, uh, all that you know out of these things, but the door will be open to express those things. But I think most people are looking for genuine relationships, uh, genuine concern, or uh, just genuine talk. I think if you just be you, uh, it will. Uh, I like to tell people uh, uh, this, and I know we're uh, about to be out of time. Like, you can either be perfume or you can be an odor, right? There's a difference between uh, being a good fragrance than being an odor. Odors stink, right? Fragrance, when people, uh, when, when it walks in the room, if the fragrance is good enough, people are going to say, man, what do you have? Boom, right? And oftentimes people don't recognize a good fragrance until it walks past it. So if it's a good fragrance and they want to know what it is bad enough, they'll come to you and say, what is that you wear? But if you're older, people will run away from you. So try in life to be a fragrance and not an order. Thank you. I think you need to do a book of quotes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to this one. <laughs> The, the only thing I will add to that is um, ask questions. Um, asking questions is something that works with all generations, older generation and even you know people younger. I'm 36 years old, I have nieces, I have a great niece. Um, I ask them questions when I wanna know what's going on with them or even if it's a topic that I, may, I know we may disagree on, um, my parents are obviously much older than I am. Um, but asking questions. I didn't know my dad was in the Nation of Islam until I was writing a paper for your class or somebody's class in Africana Studies on Elijah Muhammad. And I was like up at the table and my brother was like, why don't you just call dad? And I was like, why? And he was like, uh, dad was in the nation for like ever. And I was like, what? And he's like, why do you think he made you do this and that and read all these books? And you know, my dad and I always clashed over like feminist policy and stuff. I didn't wear jeans till high school. So it was a lot. And I was like, I had no idea. So now I'm, you know, calling my dad, asking him all these questions. And it, it sparked a whole new sort of relationship with us. But you ask questions, ask questions of older people. Um, older people love that. And then even the generation, you know, under underneath us, you know, asking them questions and finding things relatable. Even when I would work and run my department here on campus and would need to hire student assistants, it would be, harder every year to sort of um, find students to connect with and, and, and get them to work and like, oh, this, you know, Gen Z, they don't want to work. Of course they want to work, they want money. So, you know, it's, but it's, it's tapping into them and figuring out like what are the things in their interests. I mean, there's only so much flexibility we can do with the government relations office. It's just not that exciting. But um, what kind of projects can I give to them that may spark their interests in a maybe political way or not so political way, but still teach work ethic, but in my experience, it's been through asking questions, and that is what normally will spark a, a, dec a decent conversation to where you can learn something new. And for me, that's what with older people and, and younger people. Thank you. Um, what I call it is mommy and me time. Uh, my kids and I spend that time together, and I, I listen to them, and they'll say, what do you think about this mom? What do you think about that? And I'll give my opinion. I said, but at the end of the day, it's your decision. 
Um, and that's what I want you to be able to do is make sound decisions. This worked for me and it may not work for you. Uh, but we have quality time. Um, my son uh, and my grandson sent me a quote that said, uh, Carr, you may not have thought I was listening, but I heard every word you said. And uh, then he sent me a card to say, Mom, I am the person I am because of you. Because I listened to him and I gave my opinion. I said, now at the end of the day, it's your decision. Uh, I've done it this way, it may not work for you. But we sit and we talk and we call it mommy and me time. And we'll go out and he watched my face when I spent a lot of time with my grown children partying with them because and their friends. Because I want to be their friend, but I also want to be able to still give some advice and, and not let them go out and bump their heads all the time when I I know I bump my head and that's what I tell them. I've already bumped my head. Now I'm gonna give you this, but it's up to you to make that decision because at the end of the day you're gonna have to live with it. I've already I'm already set. I know who I am, what I am, but you have to make decisions that you think is best for you. This is my opinion. I'm gonna live with whatever you say. It's your decision. Thank you. Right. So at this time we would like to thank our panels of uh, distinguished speakers. We can give them a round of applause. Personally, would like to thank you all for your leadership as well as your service. You all serve as a model for young scholars that are coming up, and we hope to have other spaces where we have conversations with you. So, thank you all for your time. I know time is something once you spend it, it's gone, gone forever, you can never get it. So, I know that it's precious. So, thank you, thank you for your leadership.